Well, let us resume our public worship of God, singing to his praise from Psalm 95. Psalm 95 at the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us, everyone, a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. Let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. Down to the end of the verse, Mark 6. O come, let us to pray. O most blessed God, we thank thee for what we have sung, a psalm that speaks much of thee as the God who created all things, the one who formed the heavens and the earth and all that is therein. And we are quite amazed at the thought of the Uh, creation itself in the beginning uh, bringing all things out of nothing Uh, we are thankful Lord God that thou hast made uh, all things according to thine own will and purpose and as we read in thy word uh, thou didst but speak and it was done and we are thankful for this and the end result of uh, that uh, creation was nothing less than perfection. Uh, For as thou didst look upon all things, thou didst declare it very good. And as we look around us in our fallen world, uh, a world where sin has ravaged that perfection, 
we are nevertheless amazed because even in its fallenness, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the earth shows forth thy handiworks. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night shows forth knowledge. What a wonder the first creation must have been when uh, this fallen world is seen by our eyes as so beautiful and so uh, uh, so indicative of the fact that it came from the all-wise and only God. We pray that as we come this evening to worship Thee, that Thou wouldst enable us to appreciate that we are creatures, that we are answerable to Thee as the Creator, uh, that we are uh, uh, thy uh, subjects and thou art our master. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt give us that due humility and godly fear that ought to characterize men and women as they approach thee. For thou art the only living and true God. Thou hast revealed thyself as the uh, ever-living one. I am that I am. <clears throat> Thou hast told us that Thou art uh, the only God and that there is none other beside Thee, that all other pretended gods are but dumb idols. We are reminded of what Thou hast revealed concerning Thyself. Uh, thou art great and glorious in majesty. Thou art uh, triune in Thy being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons forever. And as we reflect upon this, we are reminded uh, that as thy Son has revealed thee um, as the uh, express image of thy person, what is said of him can be true of thyself, that thou art holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. And we pray, Lord, that as we draw near to worship Thee, that Thou wouldst draw near to us. Thou hast promised this, that if we draw near, Thou wilt draw near to us. And we ask that Thou wilt keep Thy promise to us and come amongst us and do us good. We ask, O Lord, for spiritual wisdom. For Thou hast said, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Enable us therefore uh, to come seeking that wisdom that is from above, not the earthly wisdom that men rejoice in, but that heavenly wisdom that enables thy people to discern spiritual things spiritually. And we pray, Lord God, that as we gather here, we might do so conscious of our dependence upon thyself, we are not independent, we are not our own masters, we are answerable to Thee. And especially uh, for those who are in Christ, for they are not their own, they have been bought with a price. And we pray that as the purchased of God, the purchased of Christ, we would seek to render ourselves, to uh, offer ourselves living sacrifices that are acceptable to thee through Christ. We pray, Lord God, that thou wilt be pleased to draw near to us at this evening hour. And as we seek to worship thee, we ask that thou wilt enlighten our minds in the knowledge of the Saviour. We ask that thou wilt enable us not only to be hearers of the word, but to be doers also. For how easy it is to be like the man who built his house upon the sand listening, hearing the gospel, but not responding to it, uh, hearing the words of Christ, but not doing them. Whereas thou hast called us to be hearers and doers, like the man who built his house upon the rock. We ask, Lord God, that thou wilt be pleased to bless this congregation and bless all connected with it. We ask, O oh God, uh, that as they hear this, uh, the gospel week by week, that thou wilt apply it to them and enable them to uh, build themselves up in their most holy faith, looking to thee. We pray, Lord, for uh, this nation of ours 
and we pray that it would please thee uh, to turn us again uh, from the godlessness in which we live and turn us as a people to thyself. Thou art able to uh, change a nation in a night and we pray that thou wilt have mercy upon us. We do not deserve thy mercy. We acknowledge that. We confess that we are unworthy of the least of thy mercies. But we ask, O Lord, that in the midst of wrath, thou wilt remember mercy. We pray, Lord God, that as we draw near to thee at this time, uh, that our understanding uh, might be extended and uh, deepened in the things of Christ. We pray for the Spirit's ministry to accompany the preaching of the word. We pray, O God, that thou wilt uh, take of the truth concerning the Saviour and apply it to us. And we ask, O God, that thou wilt have mercy upon us. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt be with each person gathered here. Thou knowest the circumstances of every one and pray that thou wilt deal with them according to thine own infinite wisdom. We pray that uh, thou wilt draw with the cords um, uh, and bands of love that they might be drawn to thyself. We ask, O God, that thou wilt keep us uh, from evil and wickedness. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And, O Lord God, we pray that in all of these things thou wilt take the glory to thyself. We remember the work abroad connected with our own denomination, and we pray uh, for the work in um, uh, the Americas, we ask, O oh God, that thou wilt bless our brothers and sisters there and their congregations. We pray for the work in Europe, in uh, uh, Portugal, and Spain, and France, <coughs> and we ask that thou wilt be pleased to bless thy people there. And we are mindful of the work in Sri Lanka, and we pray for Parthi and for his helpers, and ask that thou wilt extend that work and build it up. We remember the uh, work in China and we pray for the endeavours of the Church of Christ in that nation and we pray that they might be given a greater liberty to spread the word. Uh, keep them, O Lord, in the midst of their uh, uh, difficulties and help them to remain faithful. We pray, Father, uh, for the Jewish people that thou wilt turn them to see Christ as Messiah and cause them to look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn over him. We are thankful for that work amongst the Jews and pray that there would be an ingathering of thy people that there might also be blessing to the Gentiles. O Lord, continue with us. Have mercy upon us. Enable us now to uh, uh, sing and to read thy word and to meditate upon it and pardon our many sins for Jesus sake Amen Let us again praise God singing from Psalm 125 Psalm 125 And we'll sing verses 1 to 5, the whole psalm. In the law firm trust shall be thy in hell. Chat no tongue can be removed, but standeth ever still. As round about Jerusalem the mountains stand alway, the Lord his folk doth compass so from henceforth and for a. And so on to the end of the psalm. They and the Lord, the firmly just shall be like Zion.
Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and reading the whole chapter. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, but not dis yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which uh, live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord uh, Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, uh, that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many, uh, that, that the abundant grace through the thanksgiving of many uh, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. <clears throat> Amen. May God bless to us that reading from his own holy word. We again praise God singing from Psalm 1. Psalm 1, and we'll sing the whole of this psalm. Psalm 1. <clears throat> That man hath perfect blindness, who doth not stray in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinners' way, uh, nor sitteth in the scorner's chair, but placeth his delight upon God's law, and meditates on his law day and night. To the end of the psalm. 
Turn with me, please, to the passage that we read together, First Corinthians chapter. Uh, sorry, Second Corinthians chapter four, and I want to read again verses one to seven. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, second deal of Paul to the Corinthians. But Corinthians had in this epistle, he has a lot to do in defending his own apostolic ministry. The uh, Corinthian church was clearly being infiltrated and affected by false apostles. They were undermining Paul and suggesting that he lacked apostolic um, uh, gifts or apostolic authority. And uh, in this epistle, he is quite ruthless in his defense and he speaks uh, quite strongly against those who are seeking to lead these false apostles back into uh, the bondage of legalism. 
It seems that they were uh, seeking to reimpose the ceremonial uh, law of God, uh, reimpose circumcision uh, even to the Gentile converts. And so he speaks very strongly. And uh, in uh, this particular chapter and in uh, the other chapter surrounding it, he is showing himself not to be like the false apostles. He is comparing and he is contrasting himself with them. And uh, this is part of uh, that defense he is making. Uh, he describes how all true apostles and all true preachers ought to be in the verses before us. But I want to suggest that in uh, uh, speaking of the things that are uh, to be characteristic of true apostles and true preachers, it is true also that they should be characteristic of every Christian. The things that are said concerning uh, Paul, by and large, are true concerning every Christian. Every Christian can say, the Lord caused the light to shine out of darkness in my heart and uh, 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 revealed his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, the things regarding uh, the way that the apostles speak their truthfulness and their uh, faithfulness to the word of God are true also of every Christmas passage that is primarily, um, I grant you, uh, uh, a passage that speaks of the true apostle as opposed to the false apostle and apply it to ourselves as those things that are characteristic of every true Christian. And I want to do this by looking at three things from these verses. I want us to think in the first place what God has done for us. If we're Christians, uh, God has done certain things for us that are spoken of here. Notice um, uh, uh, we are told, uh, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And then in verse 6, uh, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so we have here a, a, a brief narrative of what God has done for us. And I want to suggest that we can break this up and consider it under these following things. Firstly, we can say that God has shined. He has shined into the life of every true Christian. He has dispelled our spiritual darkness. Notice how he describes those who uh, don't have this glorious light of God. They are blinded in their minds um, uh, by the God of this world. Um, uh, and who is it who are blinded? Those who believe not. That is our state by nature, blinded and not believing. And it is into such spiritual darkness that God has broken in and caused the glorious gospel of Christ to shine. Now that spiritual darkness, how bad, how deep, how great was that spiritual darkness? Well, it's described for us in showing us that it was uh, akin to the darkness that prevailed at the creation. We are told that uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we are told that, the, that darkness covered the earth, uh, that there was uh, just void and emptiness. God created this and then he said, let there be light. And he called into that uh, darkness. Indeed, he dispelled that darkness by the light of God himself. Let there be light. And that is the imagery that is being used here. The God who caused the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. 
And what is that saying to us? It's saying to us that that enlightenment that every true believer receives from God is as great, indeed greater, than that enlightenment that was there right at the beginning of creation. God gives light to darken sinners. And uh, Paul, therefore, has been speaking of the benighted sinful condition that we are in by nature. And uh, it is interesting because not only does God dispel the darkness in the human soul, but he dispels the darkness by the same agency as he dispelled the darkness at the beginning of creation. We are told that the Holy Spirit was there. And when the light was formed, it was by the agency of the Spirit of God. Let there be light, and there was light. And that same Holy Spirit is at work in the heart and lives of those who are brought into the kingdom. It is not something that we enlighten ourselves by. This is a sovereign work of God with no contribution from um, a man or from any other source. Just as when he said at the beginning, let there be, and there was, uh, no one contributed, no one helped, no one added anything to that created work. It was all of God. And when God says regarding the sinner, let there be light in that man or that woman's soul, it is all of God. And he takes away the blindness. And we are suddenly enlightened in our minds in the knowledge of Christ. And that light that is given is a knowledge. It is... Uh, uh, let there be light. What happens when we come into a dark room? We see nothing. But switch on the light and suddenly everything that's there appears. And that is the consequence of light being given to the benighted soul. When a, when a, when a, a man or woman out of Christ is enlightened and brought to the knowledge of God, they see things that were there all the time, but they just couldn't see them. They are made aware of realities that were realities in, while they were in darkness, but they didn't appreciate them. You think about the kind of things that become, as it were, visible, that we become knowledgeable about when the glory of God shines in our hearts, one of the things that we see is ourselves. We might have up to this point thought of ourselves as not such a bad person after all. We might have thought that, well, there are many people worse than me, that there are many who uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, are ill-deserving of heaven, but I'm good to my neighbor. I do this, I do that. But when the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shines in our hearts, we're suddenly made aware that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of the glory of God, that none of us are righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned. And so we are brought to see what we really are. Prior to that, we had a standard. The standard was the standard of ourselves. We compared ourselves with others. We determined how good, how bad we were. But let the glory of God once shine in our hearts and we see that all fall short of the glory of God. And so it is that Paul is speaking of this great transformation when God shines when God dispels the darkness and the light of a man or a woman, they are brought to see that they are hell-deserving sinners. They are brought to see the seriousness of sin. To listen to many today, you would think that sin uh, doesn't exist, or if it does exist, it's a, a mere trifle. It's, it's nothing to get worked up about. But dear friends, we know from the Word of God 
that sin separates us from God and separation from God is damnation. And so sin is not a light thing. It is a damning thing. It is a separating from God thing. And so we are reminded that we are brought to see that sin is an offence to a holy God. It's almost as though prior to uh, having our eyes open, we saw everything against a black backdrop. And so our dark sins didn't show up. But when the light shines and the whiteness of that light is, uh, appears, our blackness seems even more black. Our blackness, our sin, is even more grievous to God. And as we are enlightened with respect to ourselves and our sin, we are brought to see that we deserve hell. We deserve, we deserve God's wrath and curse because we appreciate a little of the holiness of God. We appreciate a little of our own sin. And as we see these things, we see that indeed we might think at first, there is no hope for me. How can I deal with this sin that separates me from God? But another thing that happens when this light shines is that it shines not in the abstract. It shines in the face of Jesus Christ. It is a shining forth of the glory of God, an exposing of our sin, a demonstration of our deserving of damnation, but it is given in the context of Jesus Christ the Saviour. It is a reminder to us that God has taken steps to save sinners, that God has sent his Son into the world for the salvation of sinners, and that he has provided an answer to deal with the blackness of our own sins. And so we see, as that illumination dawns on us, the mercy of God. Notice how he says, seeing we have received, um, as we have received mercy. And that's where it starts. It starts with the mercy of God. It doesn't start with ourselves. It doesn't start with anything good in us. It starts with the mercy of God. And as that light shines in our hearts. We see God in a new light. We see him not as a diabolical tyrant just out to get us. We see him as the God who seeks and saves sinners. We see him as the God who is manifested in the garden saying, Adam, where art thou? We see him as the God who in the person of Jesus Christ says, I come to seek and to save that which is lost. We see God in a different light. And so we are reminded um, uh, of that knowledge that the light brings. And it brings us in that enlightenment into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not light in the abstract. It's not knowledge of God in the abstract. It is always that it is um, uh, uh, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so we are reminded that this knowledge comes by knowing Christ. It is an experiential knowledge it is not a, simply a head knowledge. Now, I'm not knocking um, head knowledge. I'm not knocking the of itself, speaking here about that which no thing. It is knowledge, not simply of doctrine. It is a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so um, uh, our faith, as we saw this morning, is not founded upon um, a, a system of do doctrine. It's not even founded upon biblical facts, although biblical facts underlie it. It is founded upon Christ. And so we are reminded uh, that we can say, as a result of that personal encounter with Jesus, 
just as um, uh, 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 just as uh, John Newton could say, once I was blind, but now I see. And that's true of every Christian. There was once a blindness. There was a time when they knew not the Savior. But there is this enlightenment in the knowledge of Christ. And why was this? Why was it that God shone in the hearts of men and women? Because of his mercy. You see, that's the kind of God we have. We have a God of mercy. By mercy alone. Not by our merits, not by our worth, not by our works. If I have the mercy of God and you have the mercy of God... It's not because we are better than others. Indeed, we might be indeed worse than others. But the mercy of God has caused that light to shine in our hearts. Glory be to God. And he has done this in the lives of... And then he goes on, because uh, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy... The mercy of God, if you will, brings along with it a ministry. Now, not everybody has the same ministry. Not everybody is called to be an apostle. That's not uh, what we're driving at here. But all of us are called out of darkness to light to serve Jesus. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. That is what we have to appreciate. We are not simply saved to go to heaven. We are saved to serve Christ. And in that serving, it'll be the pathway to heaven. Not because we're serving. That's just how we should pass our time here, if you want to put it like that. But all, although they do not have the ministry of apostleship, all have a ministry for Christ. We are called to serve him. We are called to be bondsmen and bondswomen to the Saviour. So what has God done for us? He has shined in our hearts. He has given us the light of knowledge. He has brought us into a personal relationship uh, with Jesus, all because of his mercy, with the purpose of enabling us to serve him in this God-given ministry. The second thing I want to notice is what God would have us do. What does God want us to do if we are a man or a woman called into this ministry, called into this service of Jesus? What does he want us to do if he's enlightened our minds in the knowledge of Christ? Well, uh, we might say in the first place, and this is negative because Paul speaks about the negative, we are to forsake shameful habits of living. We are to forsake shameful habits of living. Notice um, uh, verse four, uh, 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, um, uh, uh, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Notice the negatives there. Renown, knocking, not handling that we have been called to. We are to forsake the old patterns of shameful living. We are to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. What was true of these apostles is true of the ordinary Christian. It isn't that the, the apostle has a different moral code from the Christian. It is that what is spoken of here for um, uh, the apostle is applicable to the Christian. We, like they, are to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. 
We are not to walk in craftiness. We are not to handle the word of God deceitfully. This is to be a pattern that we are to um, uh, 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 forsake as, um, uh, or this is a pattern we have to follow by forsaking those things. Let us just take a moment to think of what those things speak about. They renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Why does one hide something in their life? Because they're ashamed of it. And uh, when you look at these false apostles that Paul is combating, they were ashamed of being connected with the cross of Christ. They were ashamed of the problems that were arising because they were not requiring the Gentiles to be circumcised. They thought that the Jews would be better disposed towards them if the whole of the Christian church fell in with the old ways of the Jews, the ceremonial laws, the circumcision and so on. And so they wanted these um, uh, uh, New Testament Christians to be circumcised. They wanted them to follow the laws of Moses. They wanted them, in other words, to stop the offense of the cross. And that's why very often men and women hide who they are. If they're in their workplace, they might never confess that they're Christians. In the public square, they might not be willing to stand out and be counted as one who is opposed to the uh, perversions and the uh, errors that are being promulgated in the world around us. And so things are hidden because we're ashamed of them. And what Paul is saying is that ought not to characterize the Christian. It ought not to characterize the apostles, but it ought not to characterize the Christian. We shouldn't be ashamed of who we are. We shouldn't be ashamed of what Christ has done for us. We shouldn't be ashamed of the knowledge of the scriptures that we have. We shouldn't be ashamed to stand against the tide and faithfully witness on the behalf of our Savior. And so we are to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Walking in craftiness is another aspect that is to be renounced. And apparently that word, um, uh, that phrase, means that we're ready to do anything. Oh, we're walking, we're happy along, uh, to go along. But if there's an easy way, we'll take it. If a little bit of compromise will help matters, we'll be happy to compromise. By path meadow. Do you remember when Christian is walking along and he sees an easier path just across the stile and they go and they end up in castle despair? You see, that is not to be the way of the Christian. It's a great temptation. <coughs> oh, if I just um, uh, acknowledge um, uh, uh, this uh, error or that error, it'll save me from being ostracized or being thought narrow-minded or bigoted. But the Christian is not to be governed by what suits his or her own end. The Christian is to be governed by what Christ says. And he says regarding every true-hearted Christian that we are not to walk in craftiness. We are not to be ready to do the easiest thing. We are not to be ready to compromise. We are called to holiness of life. And then there is the handling of the word deceitfully. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? These false apostles, these false teachers, oh, they no doubt said, oh, we believe in the word of God, but... Or the word of God is wonderful and the work of Christ is wonderful, but. 
Christ did everything on the cross. But you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the law of Moses. And so throughout the epistles, what do we find Paul doing? He is handling the word of God faithfully. And he is doing so because there were those who were handling it deceitfully. Have you ever listened to some of these pundits on the radio or on the television? You know what it is. There's some moral or religious question comes up and they drag in um, a Reverend so-and-so or Bishop so-and-so or, or somebody else. And you think, where on earth did they get these people? They're supposed to be Christians. And they haven't a clue about the word of God. That is not an uncommon thing. You all know what I'm talking about. Well, what are they doing? Well, these people are handling the word of God deceitfully. Oh, God's word doesn't dis uh, uh, condemn this. God's word doesn't condemn that. These things are all right if they're done in moderation, if there's no harm to somebody else. Perverters of the truth. And the Christian is never to be like that. The Christian is to take God's word at his word. And they are to be faithful to it. Not handling the word of God. Not seeking through the perversion of the word to deceive others or even to deceive themselves. And so that is the negative aspect. They are not to do these things. They are to forsake these shameful patterns of living, renouncing, not walking, not handling. But then he goes on to say um, uh, that they are to bring the truth to light. But by, the manif by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And then he goes on to speak about if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If the gospel is hid to these people, it's not because the apostles are hiding it. They are bringing the truth to light. The problem lies with the unbeliever. The problem lies with the um, handlers of the word deceitfully. And so there is this um, uh, uh, exhortation. This is what we are to seek to bring to men the truth. That is our purpose. Sometimes people might ask you, why are you a Christian? And you might be embarrassed and you might, oh, well, you know, I, I was brought up in the church. Is that an answer, dear friends? Here's a golden opportunity to tell them about how Christ saved you from the blackness and darkness of sin and brought you into union with Jesus Christ. How easy it is for us um, when we've got this opportunity to shine as lights in the world. Let your light so shine before men. How easy it is for us to put the bucket over the candle. And so we are um, called to, to bring the truth to light. We are not to hinder it. Do you want to be approved by men in the world? Do you want to be thought well of? Well, you may not be thought well of because you're a Christian. But if you're honest and you're faithful and you're diligent in your adherence to the word of God, they may hate you as a Christian. But they will respect you for your honesty. Isn't it interesting? And this is true throughout history. It's true today that very often men and women in very high responsible positions are Christians. You think of Joseph in Egypt. You think of um, uh, others throughout the, the, the scriptures. Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These were men and the people in Babylon hated their religion. But they knew they were trustworthy. They knew they were faithful. Mordecai, another. You see, they were respected because they were trustworthy. 
And so as we seek to bring the truth to light, better it is that we tell the truth, even at the risk of having people disliking us. Better to tell the truth than to hide it. And so even although men may not accept the word that we speak, they will know in their own consciences that what we say is true if we handle the word of God faithfully. And then we are to live in the sight of God. Notice what it says at the end of verse 2. We're not only to be commending ourselves to every man's conscience, but it's in the sight of God. You see, when we commend ourselves to men's consciences, it's not in order to win their favour. It's not for their sakes. It's because we are walking and we are living and we are serving in the sight of God. He has called us. He has called us out of darkness into light. He has his eye upon us. He sees us. Psalm 139 tells us just how closely God sees us, knows us, and guides us. And ultimately, God will judge us, for we must all stand up, uh, up here before the judgment seat of Christ. So our great concern in all of this, in the things that God would have us do, is not to please men, not to be concerned what men think of us, but to serve our master in heaven. We are not to be eye pleasers, men pleasers. We are to serve the Lord and to serve him faithfully. So what has God done for us? He's shined in our hearts. He's given us knowledge. He's brought us into that personal encounter with Jesus and all for mercy's sake. He tells us that this great work of enlightenment carries with it responsibilities. We are to forsake our old lifestyle, our shameful patterns of living. We are to live like those who are walking in the light. Think of 1 John. <coughs> bringing the truth to light, living in the sight of God. And then lastly, what would God have us to be? We've been looking at what God wants us to do, but what would he have us to be? Well, the first thing I think is Christ-centered. Verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. He's saying, in effect, that in all this service to God, you are to take your bearings from Christ. He is your great exemplar. He is the template of your life. And so you are to model yourself on Christ. You are to put your hope for eternity and for this life upon Christ. You are not to be concerned to project yourself. How different the Bible's exhortations are to what we see today. We are surrounded by self-projection. Have you ever thought of it? Now, I'm not condemning photography just for the sake of photography, but isn't it interesting that there are so many folks photographing themselves selfies self becomes so important oh i need my hair this way i need my dress this way i need my jacket this way it's selfies what is going on there it's self projection self becomes the dominating factor what does my avatar look like what does my icon look like is it up to date is it fashionable blah 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 and then projecting self. This is what I had for breakfast. This is what I had for dinner. This is what I had for tea. Who cares? Who cares what you had? But that's not the, the thing that is significant. The thing that is significant is self is dominant. Self is dominant. 
And what does Paul say? Who should be dominant? For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. That's who should be prominent. I mentioned a little mnemonic this morning on faith, forsaking all I trust him. You all know that well-known, you should all know that well-known mnemonic um, uh, for how we should serve God. And it's joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That's how it should be. Forsaking um, uh, self. And we are not to be peddling our own wisdom. We are not to be peddling our own righteousness. But we are to be setting forth in our lives and through our conversation, Christ and him crucified. And we are to proclaim his great humanity and his great deity. And we are to set him forth as God's answer to sin, as the Lord of our life and the Savior of our soul. And if we are faithful to that, then we will crucify flesh, our flesh, with the affections and lusts thereof. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is not something strange that Paul is speaking about. This is basic Christian living. And so what would God have us to be? Christ-centered. What a revolution that would cause in our society if instead of self-centeredness, it became Christ-centered. And then going on from there, he says, the consequences of putting Christ first is this, that you will project yourself as servants for Christ's sake. And ourselves, your servants for Christ's sake. Why should we tell others about the gospel? Why should we share the gospel? Because we're servants doing the master's bidding. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. That is not simply an apostolic order. That is the, the, the uh, command for the whole church. You remember how the gospel came um, uh, in Antioch? At the persecution, people were scattered abroad. The ordinary Christians, not the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem, scattered abroad. And they went abroad and they were speaking and they, were, they gossiped the gospel. Ordinary men and women. Did you hear about Messiah? Did you hear what Christ can do for your soul? And that is what we're called to do, to be servants of Christ and we'll be prepared to give our time and our efforts and our energies and our testimony for the good of the cause. of. And then we see in verse 7 how Paul, he's spoken about this tremendous thing that has happened. The God who caused the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our heart. Think about that. A divine light shining within our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And you could just imagine the Corinthians thinking, what a wonderful thing. And then he said, but we have this a treasure in earthen vessels. This wonderful gift is in clay pots. It's a reminder to us of what we are. You see, there is no place for pride in the Christian life. No place for self, no place for pride. Indeed, we are called to be humble. Humble. Because that's all we are. We are but clay pots. If we are truly Christians, we don't deserve to be truly Christians. If we have this light of the gospel within, we don't deserve that. And so we rejoice in it. We are thankful for it. We don't want to be without it. But we must remember 
that all these things to us. God would have and God deserves all the glory. We have no right to even think that we deserve a smidgen of glory. We don't. If you become or are brought to that awareness of what God has done in your soul, the proper response is to glorify God. And then he goes on in verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, God would have us not only to be Christ-centered, not only to be servants um, uh, 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 of sinners for Christ's sake, not only to be humble, but he would have us to be without discouragement. You see, here are these apostles and they're going forth and people are not believing. But do you see the apostles getting cast down? No, because he understands the gospel, their gospel be. He understands that God is sovereign in opening the blind eyes and uh, enlightening the hardened heart. The lack of response is not due to some darkness in the gospel. It's not due to some flaw in the gospel. The gospel is the perfect message of God for salvation. It is self-blindness and satanic blinding. What a thought. What a thought it is. And yet some of us were like, all of us were like that at one time. We were benighted. The sun was shining, but we were blind. The gospel was there and we never saw it until God said, let there be light. God, who could create light in that dark world at the beginning, is able to create light in the darkest soul here. He is able to enlighten your mind in the knowledge of Christ. There's no lack of power in the gospel. Because there's no lack of power in God. We should remember that as we seek to witness to others. We need not be afraid that there is some flaw, there is some defect. Oh, we might not be great at communicating. We might not be great at witnessing. But if we stick to the gospel truths, there's no flaw in the gospel. The Son of God came into the world to save sinners. And he will save all who come to him in faith. Dear friends, what a wonderful thing that God has done such a great thing for us. Shined in our hearts, enlightened us, brought us into a personal communion or encounter with Jesus. Taught us how to put off the old man, put on the new Depart from a sinful pattern of living and seek by the grace of God to live for Christ. God in Christ did all this. And he would have us to take our bearings from Christ, to focus on Christ, to rejoice in this Christ who has been sent. And to humbly embrace what he has done, give all glory to him. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are thankful for the power of thy word and for that great ability that uh, the word has uh, to enlighten the blind, uh, to give life to the dead, to work um, in them that which they cannot work in themselves. 
O Father, send forth thy light and thy truth. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let us conclude singing from Psalm 19. Psalm 19, and we'll sing verses 12 to 14. Psalm 19 at verse 12. Who can his errors understand? O cleanse thou me within from secret faults. Thy servant keep from all presumptuous sin. And do not suffer them to have dominion over me. Then righteous and innocent I from much sin shall be. The words which from my mouth proceed, the thoughts sent from my heart, accept, O Lord, for thou my strength and my redeemer art. These verses to God's praise. for the benediction the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all Amen